Hi, welcome to the Bioinformatics Chat. Today I'm talking to Alexandra Kowajejczuk. Hi, Alexandra. Hi, it's nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you too. So you are a uh, postdoc at the Weizmann Institute of uh, Science, and um, it seems that uh, you did quite a bit of work in um, single cell RNA sequencing. Tell us a little bit about yourself, about your background, and how you got into uh, biology and bioinformatics. So I graduated with biology degree from first from Italy, actually, in Perugia, and then I did my master's uh, in molecular biology in Heidelberg in Germany. And then I was, it was obvious for me to pursue a PhD, and I joined the lab of Sarah Teichmann in Cambridge. And I was actually supposed to do something a bit different. So it was still in 2012. And when I applied, it was 2011. So it was before the single cell RNA seq days. I was supposed to do chip sequencing. But when I arrived, the first project with single cell RNA sequencing kind of appeared. And I started working on that because I found it very interesting. It was a very new field, a very fast pace. Uh, we were one of the first in the world to, to do that. I was the first one to have a single cell data set from the Fluid MC1 in UK, which was really great. So I kind of committed to this topic through my PhD for a full, full four years. And now in my postdoc, I'm also working on genomics. Well, single cell sequencing is a big part of that as well. So I was doing both experimental part and, and the analysis. Very interesting. And you mentioned something that uh, I also have this impression that single cell sequencing is something very recent. Although when I read papers, I see that uh, actually single cell sequencing or at least some kind of single cell analysis have existed for a very long time, but it seems that it really took off in the uh, recent years. Uh, why do you think uh, this is so? Well, so the first paper about single cell sequencing with just like a couple cells was from 2008, from a lab in Cambridge. And, uh, and then there was another one in 2009 for, by the same group. But only in 2011 and 12, the chemistry that allowed to sequence more cells with reasonable uh, price kind of appeared. There were a couple uh, competing methods. And basically only from this time, the, the whole field flourished and boomed. Uh, so it was around like 2000. 13, 14, 15, when everything started to develop. I mean, we couldn't really do single cell sequencing much before because there was no sequencing before, like RNA sequencing. Yeah, that's true. Perhaps <laughs> I was thinking more about like general single cell analysis. Well, there were other things. There were some, some trials of doing single cell microarrays, but this didn't really work out because uh, of the sensitivity issues probably. There was single cell qPCR, which is method which where you have to decide on which gene you analyze, and this is this was known already since a while. But I mean, single cell approaches which involved uh, microscopy or flow cytometry were known for like years, and mostly people in, who are working in immunology and they they use a lot of flow cytometry. That that's how how they uh, how they approach things for a really long time. But the 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 difference, the important difference, is that. With those old methods, you could only measure one gene or, or one protein at the time, or, or maybe five, or maybe eight, but not much more. And with sequencing, we measure all the different genes in, the, in one cell, and that's, that's really useful. Okay, so now that we have this amazing technology, what can we actually do with it? So I know you yourself uh, did uh, a few studies using this technology. So what interesting biological problems uh, can you address with, with this? Well, there are several kind of groups of problems that we can address. I mean, in the beginning, it's, it was just a, a tool to look at situations where you have a single cell. So in the beginning, in the early embryo development, you just have one cell and then two and then four. So it is not possible to do sequencing in a like our mass of, with, with the bulk approaches because you don't have a bulk. But that was the beginning. And then people realized that this could be a way to survey a population of cells. So within some populations, for example, in immune cell, cells, um, there are many different subtypes or in brain as well. And 
we sometimes we, we we know all of them, but we are, we could never be sure because the methods that we use were methods involving only measuring a couple of genes at a time. So so this method is used to kind of understand what comprises the population. So you can take this sample from the blood, from the brain, or wherever, and see what is there, and you can identify new cell types or new cell states. And these things are kind of obvious and easy to do, but then the whole technology was kind of taken one step forward, and we understood that we can also look at the at different functions. So if the system is somewhat perturbed, so for example, you add some stimulus and some cells will respond, others will respond a bit less, you can do correlation between genes and you can look at the regulatory networks. You can look at the process of, uh, you can order the cells along the process. We call it along the pseudo time. And this is also very useful to study some dynamic uh, changes from different cell states. We can see if there is some intermediate, uh, which is stable and, and things like that. Uh, it's very useful for studying development. Uh, for example, development of, of blood cells from hematopoietic uh, progenitors to different cell, uh, blood cell types that we have. It was also used for some other things, like myself, I used it to, to look at the monoallelic gene expression. You can use it to look at the cell cycle, what we also have done. So there are many, many, many questions. So it's, for example, with the cell cycle is very cool because what you can do is you put your cells in the uh, sequence them. And then without any other knowledge than the transcriptome, you can know which cell comes from which cell cycle phase. And so you can sort them and you can uh, even estimate the speed of cell cycle from this data. So this is very useful. And serving the data can give you a lot of information about your population of interest. So let's talk a little bit about cell cycles. Uh -huh. uh, first of all, like on what scale are we talking about? I mean, the, the, the type scales here are very different. I mean, the short cell cycles in stem cells that I was working with were around 12 hours, let's say. But mostly it, it is way longer. And um, if cells cycle, cycle very quickly, then what you observe is um, in, the, in RNA is that different uh, stages of cell cycle are not as discrete as if cy cells cycle longer. So what you observe is you have a cell and it will express, as, for example, particular genes that are specific for one cell cycle state, but it will also express a little bit of the previous because the degradation of the previous one didn't happen because the degradation of, the, of these genes is quite slow. So they, they have kind of leaked from the previous cell cycle state. And this allows to understand the speed. So if there are very discrete phases, that means the cells cycle slowly. But if you have this kind of spills from the previous ones, it means that it was fast because they, they didn't manage to degrade. And this is really useful because, for example, if you, had, if you imagine you have a cancer and you have different population of cancer, different clonal populations, right? Uh, because cancers are very heterogeneous, and you see that you have, let's say, three of, three of them, and you see that one of them is cycling way quicker than the others. And then just from this one single snapshot of the data, you can tell that this one is growing faster, even though you don't look through time. And I think this is pretty powerful and pretty cool. <laughs> so let's say you convinced me, and uh, I, I think this is very powerful, very cool. I want to do something like that myself. What is the uh, mechanics of a uh, single cell RNA seq experiment, how do I go from um, from a mm -hmm. tissue sample I have to something that I can uh, perhaps send to a sequencer? Well, this actually this process can be quite easily divided into several steps, and uh, and the first step, which actually is one of the most tricky and most difficult steps, is to is to have a single cell separated in some way. So. You need to first obtain a single cell suspension. So you need to use um, different enzymes or mechanical techniques to dissociate your tissue. If you work on blood, you're at one step ahead because blood is naturally single cells. And then you need to obtain them as a single cells. And there are different methods here. One is you can use a sorter to sort single cells into well plates, which is quite easy and Almost in every institute, sorters are available, so, um, so that's quite, you don't need to buy additional equipment. 
Then the other method is this Fluid IMC1 uh, machine that we, we used to use uh, in Cambridge. And uh, it has advantages because it, it is a microfluidic device that allows capturing single cells. But afterwards, you can still look at the microscope so you can see what cell looks like, what each of the captured cells looks like, which is not possible with flow sorting. And then the newest technology that is allowing us to capture way more cells than with these two previous ones uh, is droplet microfluidics. So what you do is you have your cells in suspension and you encapsulate them in droplets in a lipid phase and you can encapsulate thousands in a very easy way and then once you have your single cells in whatever method what you need to do is you need to lyse them and that's the straightforward so so by the end of the first phase i do i always have like a well played no no because if you have droplets the cells are in the droplets so so basically the way it works you have a tube or or, or some container and inside you will have like a solution a solution of oil and inside this oil there will be little droplets and in each droplet there is one cell and on c1 they are uh, on some fluid dance machine they are in the chip they are in little special positions in the chip but it's not a well played so it's, it's a very different way mm-hmm. uh to to do it Right, and and because the output of the first phase is so different, then presumably the next phases need to take this into account, right? Because uh, you have different methods, perhaps, to deal with different inputs. Well, actually, not really. There are different, like, technical ways to deliver enzymes or like the next steps to the one of these three different options, but. Chemically, the thing is the same or very similar. I mean, there are still different options for the chemistry, but like in, in purpose, they are very simil- similar. So first thing you need to add is the lysis buffer, the, the buffer that is basically like soap and it will break the cells. And if you have a well plate, it's very easy. Actually, what you do is, is you sort the cells already to this lysis buffer. If you have a, this droplet method, there are ways when you form a droplet, actually, where the half of the drop is the lysis and half of the drop, it has your cells. When the drop actually is formed, it, the lysis happens. So you don't need to add anything. And in fluid IMC1, uh, the microfluidic channels, they will like add the, the lysis buffer. So the cells are broken and they are still in either the droplet or in the well or inside the, uh, the chip. So you break the uh, like the membrane of the cell, right? But but you need to make sure that uh, all of the cell's contents is not like, spread around. Yes, well, it's not spread around because well, it's either in the well or in a droplet or in the chip. So so these are within some kind of discrete containers of of different sort, but basically it's it's, it's very similar. It's just the way how it's encapsulated is different. And then what happen, happens next is uh, your RNA is already exposed and it's in the buffer. And what you need to do is you need to reverse transcribe. But RNA in the cell, it contains both messenger RNA, so the one that um, calls for genes, and then it also contains lots of ribosomal RNA. So to avoid uh, reverse transcribing ribosomal RNA, we use a special primer that binds to the poly A tail of uh, of the RNA and it will reverse transcribe only the only the messenger RNAs and some long non coding RNAs but not the ribosomal RNAs and this way we don't lose le- afterwards reading sequencer on this like w- quite not so useful information right so this stage is pretty much the same as uh, with the uh, ordinary RNA seq where you do pretty much the same but I'm wondering because you have so many individual cells does it make it harder well there is a difference because with ori- normally now most RNA seq is actually done but the reverse transcription is done with random hexamer priming which is slightly different method so you have like short primers that have six different bases, like six random bases, and they prime randomly in the in the RNA. They don't prime at the at the end, and you obtain the poly A fraction by pulling it with beads. So it's a different way, but it's actually very similar. The tricky part here is that you have very limited material in the beginning, so you have to be very careful about not having RNAs and not losing your sample, but uh, Chemically, like biochemically, everything is very similar. 
Okay, so at this stage, you amplify the um, the messenger RNA molecules, right? No, well, you only reverse transcribe. So you reverse transcribe means they were RNA and now they are DNA. So the well, because we cannot amplify RNA because PCR works on uh, on DNA and the reverse. So so once you have the DNA, there are two ways to amplify. Uh, you can either amplify by PCR where you need to have the the DNA to do it, or you can amplify it by in vitro transcription. So what you do is from DNA, you make RNA, and you can make a lot of it. And then once you have a lot of RNA, then you can go back to DNA by reverse transcription. So these are two ways. Mm -hmm. How do you make sure that um, like once you reverse transcribe it to DNA, but then it looks the same as the DNA that that is already in the cell? How do you make sure that uh, that DNA does not interfere with your uh, process? Well, in one cell, you have only one copy. Well, two two copies, right? So it's just so little that you don't really need to worry about it because you you care about the copies, right? Because what you do in the end is uh, you have your genes and you want to check how much of the gene you have. So if you have some DNA that comes from, and you don't care about two copies, you care about 50, 50 copies, 80 copies, and so on. So if you have one more, it doesn't change anything, really. Okay, okay. So so by the end of this uh, phase, we have this uh, cDNA molecules? Yes, we have, yes, we have amplified cDNA. And, well, the amplification is necessary to have enough material to be able to sequence. Otherwise, it's just too little. And then uh, you need to prepare the library. Well, and again, it slightly depends on the method because sometimes during the amplification, you can already add the special adapters that allow uh, for sequencing, but not always. So, so it's it slightly depends. But usually, what do, what happens? You do a library, and uh, you can use a more custom made method, or you can use you know a kit produced by Illumina uh, or another company that produces sequencers. And just use that. So at some point you have to transfer from whatever you have. Like you mentioned, you may have some some kind of um, liquid with droplets or mm-hmm. suspension with droplets, right? Yeah. And you have to move from there to like a flow cell that you can uh, put into the sequencer, right? How how does that happen? How do you preserve those bubbles? Well, you don't. If you use the droplet-based method, what happens is when in the first step of reverse transcription, you add the barcode. So in each of the droplets, there is a cell, but there's also a bead with the barcodes. And this is a different barcode in each of the of the droplets. So when you do reverse transcription, on top of having your cDNA, there's also a barcode. And then you can pull everything together and using the barcodes, you can know from which RNA, like which molecules were coming from which droplet. So you can pull them together. And then bioinformatically, once it's sequenced, you can know which comes from which cell. And this this is it, right? So um, once we have barcoded sequences, we can just... Uh put them in, into the sequencer? Yes. Well, you have to make a library, but uh, so basically to put things on the sequencer, you need to add right uh, sequences at the end so the sequencing can happen, so it can bind to, to the flow cell and so on. But that's a standard procedure that you use for rna Okay. And uh, then, of course, you need to decide how much to sequence, right? Because uh, since you have many small individual cells, you want to have enough reads for each one. But of course, when you have thousands of cells, it becomes like a thousand times uh, more expensive. So you have to find some compromise there, right? Yes. So in general, because the samples, uh, the, the complexity of the library is pretty low in comparison to normal standard RNA sequencing, because what happens in during this process of preparation is you only kind of hit on only measure around 10% of the molecules. So everything that is lowly expressed, even if you have some signal, it is a little bit unspecific or, or like it, it's very hard to know whether zero is really meaning that this thing is not there or whether one, it really means it's one or, t- or maybe nine because of this problem. So... What you can actually only measure is the things that are highly expressed. 
because of this uh, procedure, how you make it. So you don't really have to sequence very deeply. Sequencing depth will depend on your cell type. So if you have smaller cells, you actually don't have to say, you cannot really sequence more because uh, it doesn't give you more information. If you have slightly bigger cells, it's better. You can sequence a bit more. That's, so that's one thing. So it depends basically on the number of molecules that you have in the beginning. And uh, it depends on the technique that you use. Because when you make the libraries, um, you can either have the fragments from the RNA spanning the whole length of the RNA, or you can do so-called molecule counting, where uh, it only comes from the very end. And, uh, and obviously, if you have the full length, it's slightly different than if you only have the very end, because there you can sequence actually slightly less. So these things you have to kind of take under consideration when you, when you decide. But in general, you know, something between 100,000 and a million of reads is, is a lot. Like people do something between that. Yeah, this uh, sequencing uh, at the end, it reminds me, I think it was like in the early days of RNA-seq, originally they did uh, that, and then they moved to like full-length RNA sequencing, which allowed them to reconstruct isoforms, right, and uh, uh, increase the uh, precision. And uh, from what you're saying, it sounds like uh, the single cell sequencing is maybe at the same stage as RNA sequencing was uh, a few years ago. Yes, I think I think you're you're right that it kind of goes through a very similar kind of development pattern. There's still like technological advances that can be made to make things better, and and they are being done. So I think we will we will get better, but obviously it will never get as good as uh, bulk sequencing in the min like meaning of precision and of like how how it really recapitulates what's in the cell because uh, because of this really low amounts of material so that's that's really at the edge of what we can do yeah so from the uh, statistical point of view i was thinking that you know on the one hand you're interested in the uh, differences between different cells, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing single cell sequencing. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, there are statistical methods that allow you to what they call borrow strength between your samples, meaning that you rely on the fact that these are typically cells from the same tissue, perhaps, certainly like from the same organism. So, there are a lot of similarities there, and uh, sometimes it is possible uh, to leverage these similarities, even if from a single cell you don't have enough signal. But averaging across many, many of these cells, you can synthesize some kind of signal, right, and uh, make meaningful conclusions. Yeah, that's true. So what what people like usually do is when they get their data, they will first perform some kind of clustering to see what kind of cell types they have. And then they will compare between clusters rather than compare between cells. And this obviously, as, as you said, it helps uh, to, to gain more information because you can see that, let's say, 90% of cells in, in one cluster expresses some gene of interest Maybe 10%, in 10%, it's not detected, but we can kind of assume that all of them express this gene and that this gene is a characteristic of this, of this particular group. So, so that's, that's a very common, common strategy. Right. And um, I think I came across some sentiments that single cell sequencing can actually be like a replacement to the classical RNA sequencing and uh, increase its uh, precision because there's this trope that whatever you get out of RNA sequencing, it is not representative of what is happening inside individual cells because cells are so uh, heterogeneous, right? And so if you sequence each cell, then you get a clearer picture of what is actually happening there. But on the other hand, there is this counter argument that you bring that um, each particular cell has very little material. So do, do you think, for example, today, or maybe at some point, is single cell RNA sequencing like an improvement 
upon classical RNA sequencing or do they have different niches? I think they are complementary. So I think if if you have a population of cells where you are not sure what cell types are there and what you can see, or you are interested in some heterogeneities, single cell sequencing is great. But for example, if you if you do that, you, you found your new cell type and it's really like great to identify what genes it expresses, you can identify what are the cell surface markers in that particular uh, new cell type that you d- discovered, right? And you can, using these markers, you can easily isolate these cells. And then you can do bulk sequencing to, to characterize it better because single cell RNA sequencing works well for highly expressed mRNAs. It doesn't work well for low expressed RNAs. There are some methods for microRNAs, but it's also way not as good as um, the, the bulk methods. And then there are long known coding RNAs and other things, uh, other RNAs that are lowly expressed. And, um, and for these, at least at the moment, single cell RNA sequencing is not, is not the method of choice. So I think in, it is useful to kind of combine. Ah, interesting. I see a lot of papers uh, somehow published about normalization of uh, single cell RNA seq data. Could you explain what uh, normalization is and why it is important? Well, there are many different things you can normalize there. (laughs) It depends what you want to do and what kind of data you have. Because like when you do quantify the gene expression, you may get two kind of different types of data. One type of data is uh, using unique molecular identifiers. And these are uh, little barcodes that you add during the library preparation and so on. And they allow you counting the genes because during the preparation uh, of the library, especially if you do PCR, there are some PCR biases and, and so on. So, when, when you do that, you you, ha- you actually can count the molecules because if some of the uh, of these barcodes appears three times, you know that it's just because of amplification, but it was just one gene. When you get this data, you have actually counts of molecules, and these are uh, way closer to the reality than if you have some kind of more abstract uh, just reads from from the from the molecules. And it's like with RNA seq, there. Are like with, there are different ways to, to to normalize right the the data people use um, to to compare between cells because it depends what you want to look at again uh, because for example one cell can be bigger the other one can be smaller and the question is whether you want to compare the absolute number of the molecules in the small cell and the big cell for which your unique molecular identifiers would be the best option or you can you want to kind of make them to be a very size and normalize and compare what would be the number if the cells were of the same size. And by the way, by size, I mean not the physical size, but rather like the total number of the molecules within the cell. Uh, so these are things that, that you need to look at. But then the other things that people normalize are things related to bash effects. And that's yet another big story because uh, most of these methods actually suffer from, from some bash effects especially the droplet-based method. So these things have to be thought of. Yeah, so you mentioned uh, using molecular identifiers to quantify the absolute count of molecules, right, rather than uh, the um, relative count. And uh, another technique, which I think they're both necessary, is uh, spike ins, right? I know this is uh, important in uh, classical RNA-seq because you typically sequence only a small sample, a small subset of all RNA molecules in the sample, in the tissue. But uh, I don't know if, is this an issue in single cells? When you sequence RNA from a single cell, are you typically able to like sequence everything there is there? Or is it still like a small subset of all the molecules? Well, I think it's a, it works a little bit different. So the spike, the role of spiking is to make sure that the library has a good quality and that the, what you see in the end is uh, in each of the wells, it's at least technically the same. So that's why you add a little bit of spiking to see that uh, in the end, 
all the spikings from all the samples should be the same, but the biological result can be different. And then you know that the biological differences are actually due to real differences, but not to the fact that there was some little evaporation in one of the wells or th- something like that. So what, what you can do is, that's why you add the spike into all the samples. And then once you have your data, you can cluster the, the samples based on spikings and see if maybe there's some bite effect, things like that. So this, that's why the spikings are very useful. So, so the complexity of these libraries is pretty low. And obviously you don't sequence all of the molecules because most of them are lost. But the, I think the problem, the key problem here is to, to ensure the uniformity of the preparation of the, the library. Right, right. Okay. And uh, once you get the uh, results from the, the uh, sequencer, and maybe we should talk a little bit how those results look like. So originally you just have a huge FASTQ file, which is just all the reads, right? So then you have to uh, sort them by the barcode and um, and then do you like in classical RNA seq you align these reads to the uh, genome or the transcriptome or maybe assemble a transcriptome is this uh, is it the same well not not really well we don't really assemble transcriptomes because uh, the quality of this data is not as great as um uh, as of the normal RNA seq, so it's better to to add, align to um, mm-hmm. to know to, to to mouse or human genomes. I mean, most of the single cell data that we have at the moment are from from these two models. I mean, maybe some zebra fish and 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 maybe there are some plants as well, but mostly aligned to the genome. And the pipeline is for for this basically the same as with the normal RNA seq. What what you do, you map, you you count your your either you count your MIs or you count your reads and you end up with the with the count table where for each cell you have number of um, molecules or, or level of expression for each of the genes. So okay. There, there's actually no 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 significant difference there. Yeah, but now uh, it starts to differ, right? Because you have so many uh, samples. So one thing you have mentioned is clustering, which is great, right? Well, I mean, I, I mean that's that's what happened afterwards, right? Mm-hmm. Then then analysis of of, of of this count table. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, there there are several things several things that we do there that are very different. Well, you, I mean, some you can also do it with. Uh, with the bulk RNA sequencing, but with the single cell RNA sequencing, these things are way more. Uh, I mean, they are crucial. Everyone does that um, because that's that, that's that's what was the question of the of the experiment. So, apart from clustering, I, I imagine you may do some kind of uh, principal component analysis. What else can you do with this data? Well, the PCA and and clustering are kind of two two power horses. And obviously, um, they can be done based on like all the genes. But what is more useful is first you determine which genes are highly variable. And then you only focus on these genes for the further analysis, because this way you kind of increase your signal. Uh, because you don't take all those housekeeping genes, all those things that don't really change. So, so that's kind of important. And to identify the highly variable genes, there are, there are different methods. The simplest one is to look at the coefficient of variation of the genes expression, and then you just pick those who are having high coefficient of variation, and then you analyze these. Because if the variation is high, then there's a big chance that actually there was a um, difference. They are differentially expressed between clusters, for example. So, so that's something that's important. And then it depends on, on your like biological problem. But for example, if you look at some dynamic uh, difference, what you do is you want to order your cells according to, uh, to this process. And again, there are thousands, like maybe not thousands, but there are probably 10 or more papers already with different uh, computational methods that, that deal with that. And the simplest one, the first one was uh, this one called Monocle, which basically uses first um, dimensionality reduction with ICA and then uses minimal spanning tree to draw a trajectory from one state to another. 
But now there are other methods using way more sophisticated algorithms. Like my colleague from my lab, he uh, from my former lab, he used this Gaussian uh, processes, uh, latent variable models for for doing the same. So it's it's good to just look through papers and see what's out there and what's what's like your choice. Uh, so this is an important uh, important problem to solve if, if you have this data. Okay, so I'm curious how you treat this software. And of course, uh, there is constantly new software. Before the software comes out, do you have a problem that you wish there was software that solved it? Or is it more like the software comes out and you're like, oh, wow, now I can do also this kind of analysis that I didn't think about before? Well, when I started with the single star and I think there was no single star and I specific tools at all. Uh, so then we, we had to figure out things ourselves, mostly uh, because single Saturday sequencing uh, community is quite tied together. So people would like talk with each other and on the conferences and these things were kind of advancing. But I think the way the things were working was kind of together questions or like ideas what we can additionally get from this data were being asked and the tools were being developed at the same time. I was in the lab and I was in an environment where like previously where most of the people or many people could uh, could develop these tools and they were interested in development of these tools but uh, it's not always like that right there are many labs where people are interested in rather than on development of tools, they're interested in answering particular biological question. And where are we now with the single science sequencing? Anyone can basically now use it. And these people would rather use tools than figure out things themselves. And they will just check different tools and see what they offer. But do you think the community needs more tools? Do you have anything specific in mind? I mean, I think most of the key problems are being addressed. But obviously, everything needs to be improved. And one of the big problems uh, in, in, in this data is, uh, is the problem of, z of zeros. Uh, in normal RNA sequencing, if you sequence deeply enough, you will have no zeros, basically, in, in, the, in the count table. But the amount of zeros there is quite low. And if you have zero, it really means zero. While here, because of, uh, of the sampling pr uh, problem in the in the uh, preparation of the of the libraries, uh, so when you do, especially when you do reverse transcription, you may have RNA there, but you may still get zero because you lose quite a lot of material, and because there's so little to start from, basically. But in proportion, you you lose quite a lot, ninety percent, around ninety percent. So, and that zeros are. You actually don't know whether in some place there is zero or actually there is some expression. So this is something that that is important for the analysis because it's 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 missing values basically. So this is this is problem to to be addressed. And there are there, there are already attempts and and there are tools that that try to 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 input uh, to infer this data. So 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 there are ways being the, there are methods being developed. Could be nice if there would be more. <laughs> Yeah. So it's it's not so much about the software, about the missing software rather than missing methods or some statistical algorithms or models. I mean, it depends what people, like which scientists you, uh, you want to address. Because if you think of people who actually do bioinformatics, they can use all the tools that are available and, and, and it's good. But there are not that many tools that are available to people who don't use the command line. And there is some some room for development there, and they are sh they are showing like showing up slowly, but uh, yeah, that's that's something that we need. Wait, are you saying that there are people who don't use the command line? Of course, <laughs> <laughs> there are. There are many biologists that are more interested in. in finding a new collagenase that will uh, dissociate their cells, which is actually very difficult. So, you know, they, they prefer to use things like tools that are kind of a bit more easy, kind of with the user, a graphical user interface. Yeah, it, that, that, that's the real world. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, now we've got quite a few questions from our listeners this time uh, i did an experiment uh, it was uh, suggested by uh, one of our listeners and the uh, the experiment was to ask our listeners 
something that they would like to ask you, Alexandra. And um, I will start with the questions posted on our website, bioinformatics.chat. So Alina asks, would be nice to hear about pros and cons of DropSeq and uh, if there are other similar promising protocols. And uh, I think you mentioned uh, DropSeq uh, somewhat, right? But maybe uh, explain a bit more uh, what it is and what the pros and cons are. Well, DropSeq is one of these methods that uh, is based on encapsulation of cells into uh, into droplets in the old phase. And there are many, uh, many more of protocols like that being developed. So the other one that was published actually, actually at the same time is uh, Indrop by uh, Alan Klein and David Weitz. So these were developed exactly, they were published in the same uh, issue of Cell. But there are now also uh, commercial solutions where you basically buy a box and everything is ready. Because for Dropsic, the problem could be that you need to assemble it yourself. And you need to have some engineering skills to do that. But now, for example, there is this Chromium 10X, uh, from 10X Genomics. It's very similar in, in a way that you can buy. And there, there are many other companies that are either um, released or are going to release soon uh, similar, similar uh, machines. The, the most important pro of these machines is that you can do a lot of sales at the same time. And that's, that's great. The cons would be that it's a, I mean, it can be pro or con uh, that uh, it's a count molecule counting method. So you don't get the full length. So you cannot do alternative splicing analysis, or you cannot look at, uh, at the single nucleotide polymorphism throughout the, the RNA. So, so these are, these are some, some cons. And the con may be the fact that it's really expensive as well. Uh, but you get a lot of data. So, I mean, the price per, Per cell is low, but the price per bulk is high. So if you need, if you don't need to have thousands of cells, if you need only have a couple hundreds, then it could be expensive. And so the the price here is driven by by reagents. By sequencing. Okay. Because if you have thousands of cells, you need to sequence them. Fair enough. Yeah. And the thing, the, the way it works is, you, it's that you cannot out of this pool of cells where you have several thousand. So let's say between two and ten thousand, or about two and eight thousand cells in the, in these technologies. It's not that you can take three hundred cells apart and only sequence three hundred. No, you have to sequence the whole thing because everything is pulled together. You could you could lower down the number of cells by giving the lower lower density of cells into the machine. But then again, then you the price of cells will rise because you use as much as uh, reagents. So well, you have to fine tune which which method to use, like price wise, depending to depending what how many cells you want. Uh, there was recently uh, a very good review. Uh, unfortunately, I don't remember uh, an author. I think in genome biology where. The authors compared all the different methods and they also gave exact prices. Maybe I can look for that and put a link somewhere. Yeah, awesome. Um, Ming Fuxiao, who, by the way, uh, was our guest in our previous podcast, uh, asks, I particularly would like to know the difference between regular RNA-seq data and uh, single-cell RNA-seq data. And uh, I think we discussed one difference already, which is sometimes... Uh, single cell RNA seq data, uh, it is um, sequenced just from one end, right? To do some crude counting. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you can you can also do that with normal RNA, regular RNA sequencing, actually. Yeah, right. Although I don't think it is done much nowadays, but maybe I, I just don't know. It's not, but it, it can be. Right. Yeah. So, um, do you know of any other differences between uh, these two types of data? Well. The number of detected genes, right, but is, is very different. So in the regular RNA seq, you detect way more genes, and uh, and the precision of your measurement, like uh, sensitivity, is is way higher uh, in comparison to single cell RNA seq. But with the single cell RNA seq, obviously, what you gain is the information on the single cell level, which you cannot ever get with regular RNA sequencing. So so this is like a conceptual big difference. But other than that, one difference that maybe is not so often like shown is uh, because you do a lot of PCR or, or a lot of amplification steps in the single cell RNA seq in comparison to, to regular RNA seq, you introduce some errors while, while you do PCR. 
like a base error. So when you want to use this method for looking at single nucleotide polymorphisms, it is not ideal because of that. Yeah. On the other hand, if you want to resolve uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, you, you can use all the uh, cells together, right? Because they share, well, like 99.99% of their uh, DNA. Well, of course you can do that. But in, like, let's say if you had this like, study where you look at sperm cells and you want to assess the difference between sperm cells because they have different evolution, evo- how evolutionarily... It says no, maybe not evolutionary, but how how they differ from each other, you know. And then for, for this kind of analysis, if you wanted to do it on RNA level, which is still probably a bit easier than on DNA level at the moment, you couldn't. It, it, it would be difficult to find, for example, de novo mutations. Oh yeah, I see. I see. Right. No, not not things that are um, are there from the beginning. Mm-hmm. But. Because these maybe are not so interesting, um, but maybe some of the novel uh, things where you could kind of build a, t- build a tree of mutations. People are thinking uh, about this, but um, at the moment, technology is not yet there to, to be able to do that, but it would be super interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay. And now we have quite a few questions on uh, Reddit. So user Bukaro asks library preparation techniques advantages and disadvantages of using molecular counting or smrt or something else okay so so this person just asks about some particular protocols the molecular counting as we already discussed it's it's really useful because you avoid the pcr bias so you really know how many molecules you have but again, as we, as we discussed, you only have the end uh, fragment. I only know how many molecules. You have no idea about what kind of uh, alternative splice variants you have in your sample. So you, don't, you cannot look at that. So if, if this is interesting for you. And the big, the, another, another advantage of the, of the end counting is it's cheaper to sequence because you only sequence the end uh, of the molecule. Um, all these methods have like advantages and advan- and disadvantages in general, and I would, I would really like refer to the, there are two recent uh, recent papers that reviewed this problem, like compared different methods in in a systematic good way. And let me check. I'll I'll, I'll find it. We'll just post all the links that you provide to the website. They'll, they'll be in our show notes. Awesome. User Enhancer RNA, that's uh, their username, asks basic workflows. Never worked with single cell RNA seq, so it would be nice to learn about what packages for what and uh, the advantages versus disadvantages of those packages at the moment. So I think uh, the user asks about maybe like R packages or something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, at the moment, there are many. And it really depends what this person uh, wants to do. I'm not a bioinformatician, like by training, so uh, I don't really know things about comparing speed, for example, of the method and things like that. Sure, but maybe you could talk about some of the packages that you used yourself in your analysis. For example, for uh, as we already discussed, for uh, looking at the trajectories, the, one of the simple packages that are very that's very easy to use is is a package called Monocle, which uses the ICA and then minimal spanning trees. It's it's really useful to to look at the trajectories. Then the other one that I we used is called SCLVM, and this package is uh, what it, this does is basically when you have a heterogeneous population, the heterogeneity comes from different things can, for example, come from cell cycle and from the differentiation of the cells and from something else. And basically what this software does, it enables to disentangle these different processes. So, for example, the signal of heterogeneity from cell cycle usually is one of the most overpowering in your analysis. And if you put uh, your cells on the PCA, you will not see anything. But once you remove the signal uh, from the cell cycle using this method, uh, you, what you can do is, uh, is you can then put, uh, put this data to, for example, do clustering or, or principal co- component analysis or something else. Uh, and it may, uh, it may actually uh, show uh, some good results 
that was not able to show before. So that's that's another package. There is another package, for example, called Cyclone, which enables to uh, you give it the data and it tells which cell cycle stage the cells come from, which is also nice. There are so many, really. So I'm wondering, how is this done? Like when you're trying to resolve the uh, phase of the cell cycle, is it that uh, there are some well-known genes that are responsible for each phase? Yes. So there is a database called cyclebase.org, which is really good. And um, they have uh, experimental data from all different genes. And they can see which of these genes are expressed specifically in a particular cell cycle stage. And based on these data, as well as on the data that were generated, like from cells that were uh, cell cycle stage was known, because they were stained, so 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 you can under, understand from which cells I can say they are. The guy who developed it, Antonio, he uh, he was able to like learn a, a model that kind of can tell uh, which cell, stage of cell cycle the cells come from. The, the other things that people use is uh, it's it's so it's really so many. <laughs> so there's, for example, from the lab of Dana Per, there are several different methods that uh, work on also on the pseudo uh, on the pseudo time ordering, which are very good, and also on clustering. So that these are also useful to to check out. Although some of these were developed for mass cytometry, they they, they also can work for single cell RNA seq. Cool. Um, user not citing Limly asks. Well, there are two questions. First, about costs regarding barcode library diversity. And uh, I think you mentioned a paper that gives some cost estimates. So I think we'll locate. Yeah, yeah. I, I, will, I, will, I will give this, this uh, reference to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. And uh, the second question is transcriptional artifacts caused by cell isolation selection methods. Wow. Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. It's true. I mean, cells get stressed when they are isolated from the tissue, especially if the tissue is uh, being treated, for example, with, with some enzymes like proteases to break the, the structure. And they are not the same as if they were in the tissue. It's, it's, it's obvious. This can be minimized by doing it quickly and in a cold temperature, but it's, it's going to be there. Uh, so there are some uh, methods being developed of uh, looking at the single cells, or at their transcriptomes in tissues using microscopic based methods. And I think these two are complementary. So if you want to make, sh you can discover many things using uh, using single cell RNA seq because some of the of the signals are still going to be there, obviously. But if you are worried about effects coming from uh, from the stress of, of extraction of the cells, then, then these methods could be a solution. And in terms of uh, protocols, are there protocols that are uh, more sort of gentle in, in this regard than others? Well, I mean, it's not about single cell protocols per se that are gentle or not gentle. The, the, the problem is the isolation of cells, which has to be done exactly the same way for many other types of experiments. So so it's the moment when, you let's say, you want to have uh, some particular cell type from kidney. You need to get a piece of kidney. And if it's a piece of kidney from a patient, then first you need to go to the hospital, pick a kidney and travel with it uh, to the lab. And then you need to uh, break the kidney either mechanically or enzymatically. And this takes time and the cells are stressed. And this is not related to single cell sequencing, actually. It's just you need to get a single cell. Uh, and that's, 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 that's the problem. Right. But that's, that's a part of the protocol, isn't it? So like, I, I imagine there, there are different methods to isolate cells and some of them may be better in this regard. Well, it depends again on the cell type, right? Because if you if you want to express extract some cells from the skin, it's different than if you want to get blood, because blood you just get you you uh, you don't have to put any enzymes. The cells are already natural single cell or the spleen. It's enough to smash it uh, a little bit with the 
with something, uh, just press it and, and you, you get the cells. But if you imagine uh, skin, it's a very tough tissue. So it takes a lot of enzymes to, to digest it and, and so on. So this is specific to the tissue of interest rather than the protocol. So depending on what tissue you use, there, there are different methods. Okay. User Moody Stocking asks, uh, my research is on single cell RNA seq, so I would recommend including something about the technical noise that comes with the single cells and the best ways to deal with this. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's true. There, there's there's technical noise uh, that is way more pronounced than than in the normal standard RNA seq. What are the main sources of this technical noise? They come from the fact that you have a low amount of, of material. For example, when you sample it with the reverse transcription, your enzyme is going to hit only some of the molecules, so you have some noise already at this stage. The noise basically comes from, from the biochemistry of the preparation of the library. Uh, and it's more pronounced because you have very little amounts of the, of the starting material. And the best ways to deal with it, I think, uh, is... Uh, Always to add the spiking because uh, spiking will be subjected to all of the processes that your sample goes through. And the spiking, you know how much you have there. So all the noise and all the heterogeneity that you will see in the spiking, that is uh, all the heterogeneity like of the spiking is kind of your baseline heterogeneity. So everything that is more heterogeneous than your uh, heterogeneity of your spiking will be actually genuine heterogeneity, a uh, genuine differences between populations. So uh, so that's why spiking is important. And then the other thing is, I would totally recommend to repeat the experiment. Uh, so if you uh, if you have, let's say, three different conditions, so you do it on one day and then you do it again on the same day. Uh, if you see the same result and that that results that that will observe uh, that what you observe is not coming from the noise and uh, speaking of spike ends you say that uh, they're great to combat this uh, technical noise well to measure it yeah <laughs> we cannot really combat it but we can we can know how much of the noise we have which is already already useful right on the other hand, well, there is still some stage uh, at which you introduce the spike ins, right? So, for instance, uh, what you described about the um, stress on the cells, right? Presumably, you cannot introduce the spike ins as early as that. No, you uh, introduce uh, at the stage of lysis. Yeah. So, whatever happens before that, you, you cannot measure that. But this noise that you are describing is a biological noise. It's, it's a biological difference because cells get stressed, but what happens there, it's a biological process. Mm -hmm. So spikings uh, can control for technical noise, the noise that comes from the process of the library preparation. And it, they also are not perfect because they don't control for the lysis of the cells because we add it to the lysis buffer. So because when you lyse the cell, what can happen is that not all of the molecules so the, the lysis doesn't happen uh, properly and not all of the molecules uh, are released to the solution. So uh, it does not draw for that. But uh, at the moment, this is the best we have. Right. User Sanger Sequence asks, any thoughts on how big of a problem a luminous index swap problem with the XAMP really is? And um, they link to an article, which I believe is... I, I know. Oh, you, you, I know this article. I mean, I... I haven't read it. I read the abstracts, but I can. Uh, it's a. It, it is an issue, obviously. Uh, if it's as pronounced as, as the authors uh, describe in the paper, so, um, the, so one of the solutions that 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 we could do is um, to have a, a barcode on both sides of the molecules. A unique barcode, right? So this way, if you when you flip, you'll still know which by reading the other barcode which uh, molecule it is. So that could be a solution. Mm -hmm. But the other solution is to go back to next sig, so the the the, the old chemistry, uh, or or use high sig two thousand. 
But well, I'm sure I'm sure this this problem will be resolved quickly. Okay, let's hope. Um, user Organellas asks capture efficiency. How much information are we missing? A lot. I mean, we there are some estimates that ninety percent we miss. It, it slightly depends also on the method. Some methods capture a bit more than the others, but yeah, it's, it's probably around ninety percent that we are missing. And I think this may be slightly improved with better enzymes, but um, well, we will always miss quite a lot, probably. Mm-hmm. User whom asks different ways of accounting for a cell cycle and how to correct for it. Oh, yeah, that's my favorite cell cycle. <laughs> so um, the first way is to use the method that I described, the SCLVM method. And basically regress the effect of cell cycle from your from your sample. It works very well and I really recommend it. The other way what you can do is you can assign cell cycle stages using methods like oscope or you can cluster uh, cells using cell cycle cell cycle stage specific genes from the cyclebase.org data, database and then using that once you know from which cell cycle phase your cells are, you can only compare the cells from the same uh, cell cycle stage. That that's another option you could you could try. So at the moment, I think these are these are two ways people dealt with the cell cycle uh, issue. But uh, the SCLVM it probably is the superior uh, way if you just want to remove the cell cycle effects uh, from from the data. Mm-hmm. User Cyrus Base VI or something like that asks uh, actually four questions. Uh, f- the first one is how to detect and deal with batch effects uh, with spikings. So uh, when you when you sequence your your samples and if you have spikings, what you can do is you can extract the uh, the spiking and try to cluster on the spiking only. And and you will see if the spikings clusters in the batches, then then there is something wrong and there is some problem. Mm. And the other way is to do a biological replicate of the experiment. So, so basically, do the same experiment again and again, and then you will. Yeah, know. especially like if you plan to publish in Nature, maybe try to replicate your experiment yourself, right before someone else does it. <laughs> yeah, no, that definitely it's 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 useful uh, to, to 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 do the replications. Yeah. A second question is uh, best way to deal with dropouts. And uh, I'm not sure if we have defined this term so far. So what are dropouts? Mm-hmm. So, so, so dropouts are this zero n- measurement that, that I mentioned. So it's, it's in the case where the gene is there, but we didn't detect it. So we, we observe zero, but uh, we, like we measure zero, but that zero doesn't mean that the molecules wasn't there. It's, it's, it's a tricky problem. And uh, that's what I was discussing before, that this is something that uh, is being worked on. I mean, the easiest way is to disregard of lowly expressed genes. And then this problem is avoided. Because if you have genes that are highly expressed, this problem is um, not visible. There are some methods that looked at that. One of them was called, Z- I think it's called ZIFA. They looked at that, uh, but I'm sure that there will be more more uh, appearing. Yeah, this goes back to, to this idea of borrowing strength. So if you see that uh, some gene or some isoform is well expressed or more or less uniformly perhaps expressed in like most of the cells, but absent in some of them, then uh, using some kind of probabilistic model, you can conclude that, uh, yeah, sure, maybe it's absent from this particular cell, but uh, there is also a good probability that it is present. It was just not sequenced. Yes, or but I think <laughs> it's a little bit more uh, difficult in this case because what you will see will be, it's, it won't be that majority has it and just one doesn't. It would be, Minority has it and majority doesn't. And from this, you would try to impute. Because if you lose 90%, then most of them actually won't detect. If you have something of a, of, with a low expression. So, I mean, it, again, it, de- it depends on what expression level you want to look at. The, 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 what you described is probably uh, the situation that you could use with genes that are moderately expressed. 
But for genes that are that are lowly expressed, it's it's more tricky. Mm -hmm. uh, next question is: Is there a way to do power analysis for uh, single cells? Yeah, and I can. Uh, there is a paper by my former colleague Valentin Svensson in Nature oh, yeah, Methods. I saw that, yeah. uh, so yes, there is a way, and it was done. Yeah, but it's interesting in which sense uh, they use. Um, a power analysis because the word power i think literally occurs like apart from the title it occurs maybe one or two times in the paper itself so uh, like the uh, the way at least i'm used to think about power analysis is when you have maybe some statistical hypothesis right you have like a uh, specific analysis that you have in mind and then in order to maybe reject the null hypothesis you do this power analysis but i think in the paper uh, you mentioned they talk more about like general uh, sensitivity and and precision of uh, measuring yeah the expression well but uh, he also looks at um for example, how how deeply you need to sequence to get information. So basically, like if you sequence more, then you don't get any more like useful information. Interesting. So there's like a point of saturation there. Yeah, that, that's a big difference between this uh, the normal RNA seq and these. That here, if you sequence more after some uh, like some moment, it doesn't matter because you just resequence the same thing. So, so, so the, this this thing is also in that Nature Methods paper uh, that I'm sure we'll put a link to. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think the last question is uh, good packages for differential expression analysis. So I imagine they're more or less the same as for um, for the classical RNA seq, or are there any single cell specific packages? Uh, there are some single cell specific uh, packages as well. It depends how, how you look at it. You can, if you want to compare between clusters and you can, you want to assume that each cell within a cluster is a replicate, then you can use the standard uh, methods that I use for standard bulk RNA sequencing, like, you know, DSeq. But there's, there are some methods uh, that are specific for single RNA-seq. But I don't remember the name, unfortunately, now. And like, this is not something that is so much used, but because the way, the way we analyze this data is rather looking at which genes are heterogeneous, and then these are kind of differentially expressed between the clusters. But we first identify heterogeneity rather than doing differential expression, if you understand what I mean. But but there, there there are some some packages. I at the moment it's just not on top of my head. All right, great. Um, now before we finish, is there anything you would like to to talk about or to tell our listeners to promote anything? Well, um, I think uh, if someone thinks that um, that this is a complicated thing to do in the lab. I would like to encourage people and say that uh, doing single cell RNA sequencing is is pretty easy, and you you can really do it in any lab. It's nothing uh, to be afraid of. And now, because the community is really large, uh, there's lots of people you can ask how to solve different problems. And definitely, I would like to recommend if someone is interested to come to our yearly single cell genomic conferences. And this year it's in Weizmann Institute, but it, it, it travels around Europe. So I totally recommend that because uh, it's a good source of, of knowledge about different packages and different methods and both computational and, and wet lab. So if someone wants to get more information, that's definitely a place to go. Awesome. Well, Alexandra, thanks a lot. This was a very educational conversation for me and I hope for uh, our listeners as well. Thank you.